as a child, were mm -hmm. you aware of the, uh, the, the tension between the United States and Soviet Russia? Um, not really. As a kid, you know, I didn't have the sense of what was going on. I knew there were problems in the country because of my dad and my mom always told me. I also knew that my dad, you know, didn't agree what, with the politics. So he got in trouble with the government. I knew that much. So I knew that they would come for my dad once in a while and they would take him, you know, put him in jail for a little bit and then, you know, bring him back and things like that. Your, your father was arrested for being uh, not agreeing, agreeing with, with the, uh, the Cuban, government. Cuban government. So he was arrested many times. If you were against the government, mm -hmm. was that something that you could discuss with a neighbor? Oh, no, no, not at all. Everything was hush-hush in Cuba. If you said something, let's say I'm talking to you right now, and I say, hey, I don't like, uh, in this case, Fidel, because during that time it was still Fidel. You know, he's dead now, obviously, but, you know, you didn't know who you were talking to, and that person could turn around and go to the police and turn you in. And next thing you know, they come in your door and they start knocking, and they'll take you, and they put you in jail pretty much. So... Well, were there cases of, like, like uh, children snitching on their parents? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Not that I know of, not that i seen it, not that i experienced it myself, but it happens all the time. It happens within, uh, within families. You cannot even trust your brother or your sister because for all I know, maybe I'm against the government and my brother is not. So whatever you're going to say or your opinion about the situation, you have to like, not talk about it. You know, keep it to yourself. My mom and my dad always uh, said to us, you know, this is not, there's a better world out there besides this, you know. We were aware of that since uh, we were kids that this, the system we were living in wasn't the ideal, you know, because uh, my mom and my dad, obviously, they grew up in a di different times, you know, so we always knew that. And I remember one time um, uh, I had to write an essay for school and I put it from the perspective, I wrote it from the perspective of my dad but he would say it to me. And it was about the government, you know, and I didn't, I was maybe nine years old. So I, this is what I heard in my house. You know what I mean? And luckily the teacher was a friend of my dad and she caught it and she stopped me right there when I started reading and she said, stop. So I didn't continue going because if I did and somebody wouldn't been there, somebody who was, you know, involved in the government, my dad and my mom, they wouldn't be in big big trouble. Luckily, it didn't go beyond that. Do you feel like you had a, a normal child? Yeah, because I don't know, I didn't know the difference, you know what I mean? Uh, I mean, like, I knew things like, uh, you know, we, we grew up Catholic, you know, the majority of Cubans are Catholics, you know, and I remember going to church and being in high alert all the time, making sure nobody that knew you from the school would see you, because even though it wasn't Religion was not prohibited, or it's not, but it was frowned upon. So if they knew you were uh, going to church or whatever, and my family wasn't highly religious, we just went to church. You know, you knew you could get in trouble in school. You knew you could get in trouble at your workplace. So you didn't talk about it. You did, you went, but you kept it, you know, in the lowdown so people wouldn't know about it. So, like, Christians weren't celebrated. We did celebrate in my house, but it's not like here that you see Christmas everywhere, you know. You did so quietly. Uh, yeah, you did it quietly. I remember that our, because uh, back home people don't do Christmas tree, they do uh, nativity scenes, you know, and they decorate everything and very beautiful. But one, da one time my dad wa wanted to give us the experience of a Christmas tree, you know, because I guess I figured before 1959, they, a lot of people were very Americanized and they would still put the nativity scene plus the Christmas tree and uh, he, he got a, like a branch from some tree and he kind of shaped it, you know, and we kind of decorated with whatever we had. And it was cute and I'm pretty sure it was freaking ugly, but at that point it looked really good and we were happy. So. Like, a, like a Charlie Brown? Like a Charlie Brown Christmas tree, absolutely. Yeah, something like that. Is it common to see like communist um, propaganda in, oh, yeah. in, on TV, oh, yeah. radio, oh, yeah. posted out oh, God. outside? Oh God, okay, so let me put it in, into perspective for you. Uh, we only have two channels. 
Uh, one channel played Russian cartoons, uh, movies. We, we started getting like American movies like lay, in the late 70s, like more. But the old ones, you know, I remember, I believe that we, we did watch Star Wars in Cuba on the TV. I don't think it was on, you know, like on the movie theater. But uh, the one channel was dedicated just to Fidel. And he would literally talk for hours and hours. He would just stand there and talk and talk and talk and talk and never stop. So you didn't have a choice. You flip this channel, you have Russian cartoons where they're horrible. The sense of humor, you know, like for a Cuban, it, it, it's different. I'm not saying it's bad, it's just different, you know what I mean? So, but that's all we saw. You know, and we were forced to take Russian anyway when we were in school, you know, and, uh, and on top of it, you know, when you change, flip to the other channel, all you have was communist propaganda, pretty much. Was, was it common to have, like, uh, black market items? Oh, like God. <laughs> of all kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff. Like, uh, you have to have black market because otherwise you won't survive. But yeah, everything was black market. I mean, food, um, my, even my dad would... My dad was a music or oh, is a musician, but you know he used to play for uh, the symphonic orchestra, and he would play for. He actually played for Kennedy, you know, one time, and he had. They were in this special room, you know, in Havana, and they had they had all kinds of stuff, Cuban cigars all over the place, you know, and there were a lot of stuff that were brought in there, like food items and all the items, and they would buy, you know, like the the Cubans, you know, from the Americans and my dad would come home with all this stuff in his uh, saxophone in his case. He would come with all kinds of stuff in there like food, goodies and you know this is what I got this time you know. And it, it was the only way to survive. And American items and um, uh, stuff like um, boom boxes and TVs and all kinds of stuff. People would buy it and overpriced you know and obviously again if you were found to be doing that you would go to jail because that was against the rule, the government, you can't do that, so. Did the Cuban state, did, did it provide anything, food to you or anything? Um, the way it worked down there, and it's hard for me to explain this, uh, we have like a, um, like a ration book, right? So every family, you know, depends how many people lived in your home, your household, that's how much food you will get for the month. So let's say, you know, Cubans eat a lot of rice. So let's say my family was my mom, my dad, my brother and I and my grandmother, so we were five of us. So we would get so many pounds of, uh, or kilograms or whatever of uh, rice a month. So this little pressure book had little coupons that you could detach. So you would go to the store, get your rice, they detach that coupon and that's it. So once you run out, you run out. So that's where the black market came right there. Once you run out of rice, you know, it's not a staple in Cuban food. So you don't have no rice, you don't eat. Because people have rice for break, I'm sorry, not breakfast, but for lunch and dinner with, you know, steak, beans, whatever, plantains, whatever. So, um, yeah, it's not the only way they did. And then they had, lately, right before we left, they opened up these special stores or whatever, that they would sell Russian items, um, Russian meat, they call it Siberian meat because uh, people said that they were, they were making, that's what the rumor, of course it wasn't true, that it was like people that they would send to the Siberian, they would die and then they would cook him and put him in cans and can him and that's what we were eating. Sure so, was. Yeah, well, I, if, it was, if it was too late, I ate it, you know, it hasn't killed me yet, so. Um, and um, yeah, it's, then you had to go to that store, but not everybody was able to buy in those stores because it, they were overpriced. And uh, let's say my dad, um, he was a musician, like I said, he made, it does in Cuban pesos, like $350, you know, uh, Cuban pesos. That's a lot of money for, during that time for Cuban standards. So we were able to go buy stuff at the store, but people that were on the lower, you know, side, they couldn't afford to go there, so they would go hungry. Or they would have to go and knock on people's doors and say, hey, can I have some sugar? Can I have, you know, some rice or whatever? I, I give it back to you when I get it, you know, the beginning of the month when I get my ration, you know, things like that. Did you ever see Fidel in person? I saw him once, but I was, like, from far. We had, a, like, the whole school had to go, 
you know, and he came to this amphitheater and he spoke for hours again, you know, and we had to dress, we had to make sure our uniforms were like perfect and our shoes were shiny and our socks were like white and all the way up here, you know, and it had to be, and then of course you have to <laughs> clap, you know, even if you didn't know what the hell they were talking about, because he, he just, as you talk for three hours, you made no sense anymore. You just repeat yourself, you know. Did you pay taxes? Did you have to do any work? We don't pay taxes in Cuba, but um, like, for instance, uh, we all do volunteer work. Volunteer, because if you don't go, you lose your job, or you become, you know, a non-wanted member of the Cuban society, you know what I mean? Once you hit sixth grade, I want to say, you have to do volunteer work on the countryside. So they take you for 45 days. They take your kids for 45 days, whether you like it or not, and they take into the countryside to work in farms, to work on the tobacco fields, to work on the sugarcane fields. And uh, they put them on these like common houses or whatever with like bunk beds, you know, and they have to like shower with like super cold water in the mornings. You know, even, even though it's a tropical climate, it's still cold in the morning, especially in the country, you know. So, and, and supposedly that's volunteer work, but it's not. You have to do it once you hit uh, sixth grade. They just take your kids. You know, and they, I didn't go because uh, my dad knew, you know, he didn't, a lot of girls came back pregnant and things like that. A lot of stuff happened there because, you know, you, you don't have your kids with you for, and they're under the supervision of these people that you have no idea who they are, you know, boys and girls together, you know, at that age. So my dad didn't want me to go, so um, <laughs> they made me eat a lot of butter, a lot of butter and pumpkin and they took me to the doctor. My dad, you know, in Cuba, everything is who you know. So this person is your friend and they'll help you, you know, so, because it's the only way you can survive the system during that time, that was the only way. So, you know, I, I ended up having hepatitis, you know, which I didn't, you know, so I was able to stay home for the whole time, I didn't go. I didn't experience that. And I ended up not going, but a lot of people, you know, it's something that they make you do. And if you don't show up, you know, the only way you cannot go is, like in my case, you know, if you have like a doctor's note that said, okay, you're skewed. So otherwise, 45 days on the country working for free <laughs> for the government. Did you have any family that participated in the Cuban Revolution? Um, I have one cousin. Uh, that was very much involved. I mean, you're talking about, because that's just confusing, as far as the Fidel, the communist part, or the, the, the one that was fighting against the communist? Which one are you talking you, about? Uh, did, did, did anyone participate you know, in any stuff? Oh yeah, my, all my family, actually. Um, my dad was in jail for 10 years. Uh, he was one of the young, my dad actually has one of the lowest numbers, prisoners uh, numbers in Cuba. Uh, he was uh, maybe 21 when he went to jail. My grandfather went to jail. My uncle went to jail. Uh, a lot of people in my family, uh, because they all, um, like my, not on my mom's side. My mom's dad was in the military, but he wasn't involved with a president. He was just an army man. He was a lieutenant, you know what I mean? And he, he said that he swore the flag and that's all he cared about, nothing else. Now, my dad's dad was a diehard Batista follower. So when Fidel takes over, obviously, you know what, they were, you know, in a lot of trouble. But Batista so, being the president of Cuba that was overthrown. Yeah, by yeah, Batista. yeah. So yeah. when Fidel takes over, you know, my dad right away, you know, my that, uh, grandpa and stuff like that. Well, my grandpa actually, uh, my dad's dad, he didn't think it was gonna last. He said, no, this is, this is gonna be, over soon, and and that's one of the reasons he didn't leave because he, he was he wouldn't be able to he, he he had the means to leave right away and go to Spain and he didn't because he said you know this is not gonna last this is gonna be like one of those you know in Latin America that happens for a little bit and then everything goes back to normal but it didn't <laughs> so they got stuck in Cuba and my dad started fighting my dad uh, he. He did a lot of stuff, you know, to overthrow the government from blowing shit up and, st sorry, stuff up and, you know, doing all kinds of stuff. And finally he got, you know, detained, they found him. 
and they put him in jail, um, his first sentence was uh, died by uh, the fire squad. And they did shot at him, uh, we blanked, just to torture him, just to, you know, drive him crazy, you know what I mean? And then they lowered his sentence to 30 years, and then 20, and then he ended up only uh, being in jail for 10 years. And then uh, he was uh, in Pine Island, I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's like, a, you know, Cuba's an archipelago. It's not an actual island, it's an archipelago. And right underneath Cuba, there's a bigger island. It's the second biggest island of the archipelago, which is called Island. For Cubans, all stuck Cubans like me, older Cubans, I'm 51, it's, uh, we call it Pine Island. For newer people, we, they call it the Island of Youth. Because Fidel had the great idea of renaming everything, even the country and the provinces and everything. So I don't know why. So anyway, he turned that into a big old jail. And all the people that uh, you know, were fighting against the government, it's like a round jail like this, you know, and there's no way of getting out. And all the people that were fighting against him when they got apprehended, they would go there. You know, so my dad spent like 10 years there. And then uh, he, uh, they let him go. And, but he had to go like every day to the police station and sign, like check in with them, like he wasn't doing anything. So he, every day when he got up in the morning, he had to go sign in the police station. And then when he came home from work, he had to go back in there and sign it again. So it's like, I don't understand the point of doing that, you know, I and mean, just to keep control of everything. Was Ernesto Guevara a um, respected he was individual? An, he was an asshole who killed a bunch of Cubans without any, uh, I, I really hate that when people ask that question. Not, not you. Uh, Ernesto Che Guevara was an Argentinian that you know, went to Cuba and killed so many people, raped so many people, did so many bad things. You know what I mean? Every time that I see somebody with a t shirt or a tattoo or a flag, you know, I'm like, do you need to get your history, the shirt with the face? You get it. He's not an icon of anything. He was an assassin, he was just a disgusting person you know, that Fidel had killed, because that's exactly what happened. You know what I mean? He, he had him killed. You know what I mean? He, he didn't just die. He didn't just, you know, when Fidel always had this thing that when somebody was making him look bad, or he, somebody was getting more popular than him, he would get rid of them. That's exactly what he did with Che Guevara. That's exactly what he did with Camilo Cienfuegos. He, he got rid of them because they were getting more popular than him, and he didn't want any competition. So, so you when know. you see when you see people wearing the shirt, when you see the, the posters, oh, like the college pisses, kids who, pisses me who, off. Uh, who look up to this guy. Yeah, it pisses me off so bad. Yeah, yeah, it's like people need to get the history, you know, straight and get a little bit more deeper in what happened in Cuba with that guy, you know, because he wasn't a nice person. He wasn't the icon that they have made him to be. You know. When I was in school, I was a straight-A student, you know, I don't know why, <laughs> but anyway, uh, so for straight-A students, they had special schools in Cuba during Fidel. Not everybody got to those schools, you know. Uh, they had like, they, they call them vocational schools, and they have uh, one in Havana, they have one in the east side of the island, they have one like in where I'm from, which is I'm from the west side of the island, like the, the uh, Pinal de Rio, where they grow the tobacco. The, uh, that's not where I'm from. That's where I grew up. I'm from Havana, but I was I left when I well, they took me there to Pinal de Rio when I was eight months old. Anyway, so I'm, that's what I, what I consider myself to be. They have one of those schools right here. They have another one in the middle. They have another one like right, you know, on the eastern side of the island. And those schools are for the kids that, you know, do really good. But not only academic academics, but only, they also have to be involved with the government. They have to belong to the communist, you know, communist youth, you know, organizations and stuff like that. And th then again, I'm talking about my time when I was in Cuba. I don't know how things are right now. And uh, I, I heard, and many people saying that, you know, kids that were already on that, um, going to like college, you know, university or whatever, that this kid, uh, let's say I wanted to be a lawyer, because that's what I wanted to be. And you got there with the intention of being a lawyer, you know what I mean? And they'd be like, well, but the government really needs doctors right now. Because we need to, need the, we need to send doctors to Angola and El Congo and whatever they were helping. So uh, I know you want to be a lawyer and now that's what you want, but Fidel needs you right now. And he needs you to be a doctor. So you're going to be a doctor. And that was it. That's how it went for a long time. And 
the government paid for everything. Obviously, you know, you didn't have to pay for the schooling or anything. But if by any chance you left the country or they knew you were leaving the country, you were trying to go to the United States or whatever, they would make you pay every penny before you left. A common uh, practice nowadays is for Cubans to, to fix up classic American cars. Yeah. Yeah. And was that a, was that a thing at the time? Oh yeah, always. Yeah, always been because uh, all the cars after 1959, people don't know this. Cuba was one of the most advanced countries in Latin America. I believe ranked number two after Argentina. Huge immigration, European immigration. Huge. Uh, I mean, all kinds of stuff. It was. It was. A, it had problems. It didn't need a revolution. It, need, it needed some changes anyway, but not a revolution. But anyway, uh, so the cars that were made in the States were actually tested in Cuba before they were even, you know, they were riding right here in the States. We actually had them already in Cuba and then they would come to the United States. So we, you know, and people love their cars, they're American cars. People are very pro-American in Cuba, you know what I mean? And the cities that they can't really like talk about it, you know, and uh, they always been. And, um, after Fidel takes over, you know, slowly but surely, we didn't get any more American cars coming in. So we started getting uh, Russian cars. And I don't know if you've ever seen the Lada. When you have a chance, if you can Google it, L-A-D-A. -A. They're the ugliest cars. They're like a box. It's like, it's, there's no thought about it at all. The way they make it, there's no design. There's not, it's just like a box, like this. Boom, 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 just like that. With four wheels. That's it, you know, and just like tiny little cars. And that's what we were getting Renaults, and uh, I don't know if you're familiar with those, and uh, Lattice, and there was, there was another brand that I just don't remember the name right now. So those were you will see. So people that had their cars, that the people that were lucky enough that the cars they had were not confiscated, because like my family's car, they were confiscated, you know, by the revolution, you know, they were able, they just kept them, they just kept them. And to, at this point, you can see like a Buick, like a beauty, beautiful Cadillac, you know, like shiny, and, and you open, you know, the hood, and inside it's just a whole different car. It's a whole different car, because, you know, they need, and they put new engines, they put all kinds of stuff just to keep them running. And they, they've been doing that for, since I've been in Cuba. You know, that's, uh, when I uh, remember the taxis that they had, to go from, because I had family in Havana, my grandparents from my, ma my mother's side were in Havana, and we would go there a lot, and we usually take a taxi, because the distances down there are not as big as here. You know, it's an island, it's not that big, you know. And my dad would get a taxi, and it was always an Ameri all American car. You know, it was like either a Buick or a Cadillac or Oldsmobile or something like that, you know. And they always, they run really good. Did everyone have a, a TV, a radio? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't. I don't think everybody did. There were people that didn't have a lot of anything. Uh, I know my grandparents didn't have a TV in Havana. They had a, a radio, like a big old console, you know, one of those huge things. You know, they had one of those. We had a TV, only one, and it was put together by my dad. My dad not only he, he's a very uh, man of all talent, you know what I mean, he's an uh, electrician and he, he could fix anything, you know, so he would take like the, the TV screen, you know, the old box TVs or whatever, and pretty much build around it and make it work. So we had one TV, I don't, I don't remember how big it was or whatever, yeah, no, I just tried, but it was one of the old ones, really, really, really old, you know what I mean, that you have to get up and turn the dial to change it, and um, a lot of people, I know a lot of people didn't have TVs, a lot of people didn't have radios, a lot of people didn't have a lot of anything. So despite it being a communist country where everyone is supposed to be equal, was it, uh, was it common to see a, a big disparity? Oh, absolutely, in, oh, absolutely, oh, absolutely. In, in wealth? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And even, like, I, one thing I remember very well is, like, um, okay, so, my neighborhood was like right here, and then there was this alley, alleyway, and behind the alley there were these apartments, right? Really nice apartments, like beautiful. That's how I remember them as a kid. Uh, they were for the Russians. So the Russians didn't go to school with the Cubans. The Russians had cars. 
the Russians, and I'm talking about the Russians, and then of course in the Cuban people too. Russians had car, they had cars, they had um, all the things that the Cubans didn't have. Was it common for you to, to, to pass Russians on the street? Once in a while. Did you Once have to like give way to them? Let them no, pass or like no, that? not really, not really. I mean, they were common people, like they just had a better life standard than, because I think that a lot of them, because they would say, okay, if you go to Cuba and whatever they were doing, I don't know, okay, for so many years, then when you go back to Russia, we're gonna give you a house, and we're gonna give you, uh... so they didn't really have a lot of choice either. It was pretty much like, um, you know, we do this, you do this, and we give you this. You know, and that's the, since the way things work in this type of system sometimes, you have to do certain things so you can, you know, have a house or, you know, like we had a house because it was something that, you know, it was ours before, you know, Fidel took over, but a lot of people didn't have houses and things like that. You know, a lot of people li lived in like places that were like a house and they would like divide the house in little rooms and you have families living in, in one little room, you know, so yeah, it's, I don't think they were just common people that were trying to survive too. I remember having a cousin, uh, he's still in Cuba actually, he's way older than me, and I don't know, you're too young for that, but 1980, when all the people tried to leave Cuba on the uh, uh, boat lift, uh, to, uh, all these people, they put them on boats and they send them here, and they emptied the jail, because that's pretty much what Fidel did. Put about, your family will come from here to pick you up, and he would say something like, okay, you want to take your family to the United States, you got to put all these people in there, otherwise you're not leaving, and I don't know why, was that during uh, Carter, that, that happened in 1980? Yeah. <sighs> trying to remember. Wasn't Carter, Reagan, Carter, right? Carter would have been 76 to 80. So it had to be during Carter, right? Yes, it would have been the end of Carter's term. Yeah, that's when that happened, I think. And during that time, uh, it was 1980, right? That's what, because I, I, I got my dates messed up. Reagan and. Was the 88. So Reagan was like right after Carter, right? Yeah. So he he served for, uh, two terms. He did. Okay. Yeah. So I remember that um, what happened during that time was that um, a lot of people knew that okay, this person is in the neighborhood. You know what I mean? Every neighborhood is controlled by a police station. In every corner, there's a either a police station or a CDR, they call it, which is a group of people that the whole, it's like a neighborhood watch, but it's pretty much to keep the revolution under control and keep people under control. It had nothing to do with a neighborhood watch as, as the meaning that it has here, you know what I mean? So they pretty much know who's leaving the country, who's, who's have family in the United States, who's trying to. So when that, when that happened during that 1980, Fidel gave permission to the people to go from house to house and harass people and do all this, like, that you will have hundreds of people, if they knew your family was, you know, against the government or you were trying to leave, they would come in your house and they would stand there for hours and days and chant, and scream, and throw rocks at your house and eggs and all kinds of stuff. And they did that. They actually killed a lot of people during that time. Uh, I don't think people saw the, that here in the United States. There was a teacher uh, from my school that he was uh, anti-communist. He, he was like very outspoken, even though he knew that that was something that, and there's always people like that in every system, that they're not afraid, they just do it. You know what I mean? And then when he lived on a uh, third floor, I believe, in an apartment, and this mob went upstairs and they grabbed him by the legs and they drag him like by the steps and they kill him. You know, he, when he was down, you know, he was dead. And they did this for days and days and days and days and days. One of my cousins, uh, he was in the military and he was somehow communist to the eyes, to everybody's, you know, that's what people thought he was anyway. And I remember he coming to the house because during that time we were afraid to leave the house. We would jump over the fence instead of going through the front door, we would go over the fence because uh, there were people in front of my house like screaming and chanting and, and you know, my grandmother was sitting outside and they threw a rock and hit her on the head with the rock. And uh, so my cousin came one day and because he was dressed up in, you know, his 
army clothes, you know, they let him in. And he went and talked to my dad. I said, you know, even though I'm dressed up like this, and you think that I'm, it's like anything you need, anything you need. You need guns, you need anything I have. You let me know and I'll bring it. Were there unique Cuban customs that you participated in? <laughs> so many. <laughs> you don't get to do here. <laughs> so many. Cubans are, we're superstitious people, um, you know. Okay, so New Year's Eve, and kind of hard to do in Iowa because it's so cold. But New Year's Eve, you know, um, like right before midnight, you take a bucket with water and you throw it out of the door and you sweep, 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 sweep to get all the bad influence and all the bad stuff. So we did that. I, was, I still try to do it, but here, I, obviously, in Iowa, you can't do it. You throw the water out and freeze it, you know, most likely. Um, seems like, um, and that's something that I still do, and you probably think I'm weird for it, but uh, um, since I was a kid, I remember my dad saying, um, you know, if we buy a new house or whatever, before you even move in, you have to take a coconut and you have to put it in every corner of the house. You gotta move it. So you put it like on the front door and then you move it through every corner. Every day you move it a little bit. And then, <laughs> love, please. <laughs> and then when you're done with it, you break it. It depends how it breaks, you know, that's how. Uh, I mean, see, another one that I love, this is my favorite. My husband, who's, he's white, he, he always does it. He, after 20 years, he, he does it. When we lose something, like, oh, you put your phone and you can't find your phone. It's like, oh, where's my phone? So you tie this certain saint nut. So you take up any uh, sock, you take a napkin, anything, and you make a knot really tight, really tight. And you said, little prayer says, help me find blah, 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 blah. For some reason that I don't comprehend, things always turn up. <laughs> you always find them. <laughs> yeah. And then after you find them, you take your whatever you tie and you untie it because you cannot leave it tied up. Because next time if you lose something and you didn't untie him, then he will help you find the stuff. So there's millions of stuff. Typical breakfast for a Cuban would be, it was hard for me when I came to the States to get used to eating like eggs and bacon for breakfast. Now I love it and I, I love it. But at uh, the beginning, because we, our breakfast is very simple. It's like something like this, but maybe a little bit bigger on a cup and then uh, bread with butter. That's what we eat for breakfast, just like Cuban bread, which is very similar to French bread. French bread is almost this close to Cuban. The only difference is that Cuban, uh, French bread stays soft for a couple of days. Cuban bread, you can kill somebody the next day. It gets so hard. Like the, the day they make it when it's fresh, it's delicious. The next day, you can eat it. So, yeah. And flan. Oh, 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 flan. Do you like flan? I, I don't know that. You never had it? I've always meant to have it. I don't think I ever oh, had it. You're going to have it soon, because I'll make it for you. Okay. You will lo you're going to love it. Today. We left Cuba in 1984. Um, we were supposed to come to the States first. We were, you know, we had everything ready here for us to come, you know, legally. Um, we had a house. We had everything. My dad, you know, we're political refugees. Now, in 1980, what happened, what we were talking about earlier with all the people coming from Cuba on the boats, everything got, everything is stalled, you know. We don't have an embassy in Cuba. We have an interest office, that's what they call it. But during that time, you couldn't get anything. They weren't, they weren't accepting anybody. So somehow, we uh, got stuck in Cuba. 1983, my dad started getting detained by the police. They come in the house every day. They take him, uh, every, every other week, they would come and put him in jail for one week. Uh, the last time they took him, they came, they were armed. They came on, you know, one of those Russian jeeps, you know, there was like four men, they were armed. Uh, took him to jail, they put him in there for two weeks, and when they released him, they said, we don't want you in Cuba anymore, you need to leave. So my dad started panicking, started trying to find any country that would take him, take us. You know, we had applications, you know, during that time, because we were, you know, legally, my dad is, an, he, 
you know, we could have gone to Spain, you know, because because of the citizenship stuff and there, whatever. We couldn't live. To, we couldn't go to Spain. We couldn't go to Peru. We couldn't go to um, Switzerland. We couldn't. We tried living through so many different countries because that was an emergency situation. You know, we had to leave. Uh, the only country that gave us a visa was Venezuela. Uh, they actually approved it. We uh, ended up living through Venezuela. Uh, like I said, I had a, uh, we lived there for uh, five years, I believe, give or take. And then uh, here we came to the Catholic Church, to the Catholic Church. We, uh, 1989, I want to say, um, since we're getting really bad in Venezuela, since we're going, you know, Carlos Andres, uh, Carlos Andres Perez was the new president. He, since we're bad, my dad always had this political vision that he can see what's going on. He's like, nope, we gotta leave. We can't stay here. These things are gonna get really bad here, so we cannot be here. Because we were, we liked it there. It was nice, you know. One advantage of it was Spanish was the first language. You know what I mean? And all that. And uh, long story short, um, we started the process again of, you know, leaving, and we did it. The legal way, we had to go through medical screens, we had to go through all kinds of stuff. My dad had to go through all kinds of interviews with the embassy because with him having a history of being in jail, you know, uh, they actually told him that he couldn't come because he was a terrorist. And he said, well, uh, sure, no problem, but I can provide you all the names of the people from the CIA that provide me with the plastic and the dynamite and everything. You want names right now? Because I have. And right there they went like, okay, sorry. Here, here's your paperwork. You're approved. So, um, yeah, that's the, through the Catholic Church, but legally we got here, we, in, we landed in, in Miami. And Miami, when we were getting out of the plane, and I remember that um, um, everybody went this way and we, they took us and they put us in a different room and immigration was waiting for us right there. Uh, people from the INS or whatever during that time, you know, and we had, um, they gave us our paperwork uh, you know, like uh, per, uh, temporary residence in there. And then they said after a year, you have to, you know, you apply for your permanent one and you get it. But we, we came, we had to go to school right away. You know, we, it wasn't like we came and we, you know, we came and we were taken to a certain, uh, to LA because that's what everything we, all the help that we have from the Catholic Church was in LA, Los Angeles. So we couldn't, that's what, how we ended up in this part of the country. We couldn't stay in Miami. We had family in Miami. My family was like, you guys stay in here? And we're like, no, we gotta go to LA. So we ended up in LA. Uh, the next day we were already in schools, you know. Um, my dad was working, my mom was working pretty much. Uh, sometimes I think about it and it's like, how do we made it through all this, you know? That's what I, with my son, you know, cause sometimes I see these kids, you know, they're so spoiled. They have so much, it's like, dude, at your age, I never had what you have. And it's not even the financial or economic aspect of it is like the freedom you know that they have to choose stuff it's like when I and and I, and I say it and I, you're not recording right right now no I don't no you are that's fine but it's like I I appreciate this country so much because you know I have a regime that I would have never had in my country you know I don't care there there are people every day trying to get here Oh yeah. Their oh yeah. And oh yeah. Up their lives. Oh yeah. And oh yeah. It's, it's it's easy for for people who grew up here, who were born here, uh, who, who don't understand what they have. Oh yeah. The opportunities they have, and to, it's easy for them to crap all over these people who are so desperate. Yeah. Those those opportunities mm -hmm. that they are willing to risk the risk their lives mm -hmm. to die in the desert. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To get mm -hmm. abandoned by coyotes mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. desert. I mean, I didn't have to do it, but you know, because I was a kid and my parents took me out of that situation. You know, I and I forever be grateful to my parents for because I sometimes I ponder. You know, I see my life, and I you know I have everything I I want. You know, and I work hard. You know what I mean? But I don't mind working. You know what I mean? Working is part of. That means that I'm healthy. That means that I can actually get up in the morning and do something. You know, some people wish they could. You know. But, you know, I'm like, I want, sometimes I wonder what I would be doing if I was in Cuba. You know what I mean? What my life would be like if my dad would have the courage and my mom to leave here, because we left everything. We left my family, my grandparents. You know, the one memory that I never, ever forget 
was the day that we left Cuba. That, I can see it in my mind. Getting in the taxi, going to uh, the airport, and me and my brother sitting on the back of the taxi, turning to the, you know, the window, and my grandparents running after the car. I'm waving at them. That was the last time I saw them. So. Yeah, you're here. Yeah. And I, sorry. No, you're, you're fine. Yeah, I, Thank you. Thank you're you. welcome. Thank you very much. Oh, no problem. Really yeah, appreciate okay. it. That always makes me cry every time I think about that. But yeah, this country's great. You know, people don't appreciate it.